Welcome back. Today, let's discuss berberine. You may have heard of this plant compound that's been studied for weight loss, blood sugar, cholesterol. And in fact, you may have even heard of one fairly seminal meta-analysis comparing the effectiveness of berberine for blood sugar against that of metformin. And also it has uses for gut health. So let's take a moment and look at this traditionally used plant alkaloid, pass it through a filter of modern science and see what we can learn. Where or when should we use it? When might we not want to? And then also provide you usage guidelines. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical science-based insights into health, exploring the importance of nutrition, lifestyle, and gut health through conversations with experts, research reviews, and personal stories. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. As I mentioned a moment ago, berberine is an alkaloid think caffeine, nicotine, these are both plant alkaloids. In this case, from a variety of plants, barberry, golden seal, golden thread, Oregon grape. And the use of berberine does date back some 3,000 some odd years in traditional and, and ancient Chinese medicine. So a interesting backstory, but again, we want to see if the traditional uses for gut and for wound healing and for metabolism hold merit modern day when examined with science. So let's start off with weight loss. As many compounds do, they have and they exert interesting impacts. So in this case, the impact of berberine does improve fatty acid oxidation and thermogenesis and therefore energy expenditure. However, when we look at a 2023 umbrella meta-analysis looking at 13 studies, over 17,000 individuals being studied, the effect of berberine on weight loss was 1.9 pounds, considered non-significant, leading the researchers to conclude our umbrella meta-analysis showed no significant differences in the changes in body weight following berberine treatment. So weight loss would be an area, I would say, berberine, probably not going to be super effective. Conversely, there's some pretty compelling evidence regarding cholesterol. So let's walk through this data. Mechanistically, again, we see interesting changes wherein berberine will upregulate LDL receptors in the liver. This will help remove cholesterol from the blood. And simultaneously, kind of like a twofer here, you'll see a decrease in cholesterol absorption in the intestines. Looking at a 2023 meta-analysis summarizing 18 clinical trials across 1,700 individuals, they did find some pretty impressive benefits from berberine. A 18-point reduction in total cholesterol, a 18-point reduction in LDL cholesterol, a 13-point reduction in triglycerides, and an improvement by about 2.3 points in HDL cholesterol. Okay, so we can go even a step further, and we can compare directly a statin medication for cholesterol to berberine. There was a 2019 meta-analysis looking at 11 randomized control trials in over 1,300 patients comparing simvastatin, aka Zocor, to berberine. And I love these studies because they give us a real ability to say, well, my conventional doctor wants me to do this. What is the natural alternative? And when we can study them head to head, that I think gives a healthier consumer a pretty accurate ability to gauge the effectiveness comparatively. And when comparing, they found similar improvements in cholesterol total, LDL, and HDL. And there was actually a slightly better improvement in triglycerides favoring the berberine. As I've said before, it doesn't have to be either or, it can be both and. So as a part of this study, they looked at berberine combined with simvastatin, and they found an even better reduction in total cholesterol, although there was no additional benefit for LDL or for HDL. Now, the other thing here that I feel is very important to bear in mind, there were less side effects in the berberine group, either when given berberine alone or when berberine was combined with Zocor. Specifically, there was less elevation of liver enzymes and there was less muscle aches 
kind of an AKA for this condition known as rhabdomyolysis, where you can have muscle damage due to the effects of the statins. So I find this pretty compelling. Now, there's not data looking at other statins, but boy, I would say this is, and if it were me, I would certainly want to discuss with my healthcare team, either using berberine alone or in combination due to similar effectiveness for cholesterol and less side effects. Also, as I did a little bit of digging on this, you see some studies looking at the effect of berberine to increase cardiac output, most specifically, but not limited to left ventricular ejection. So there might be multiple benefits that we see from a cardiovascular perspective when looking at berberine. So I would say definitely consider it for this area. Blood sugar is another area wherein you hear claims about berberine. And this is because you can see improvements in insulin and glucose, either sensitivity or uptake, in part by modulating certain enzymes known as SIRT1 and AMPK. Looking at a 2021 meta-analysis, in this case of 46 randomized control trials, looking at over 4,000 people, quoting, Berberine showed effectiveness in lowering blood glucose comparable with metformin. So we have yet another study comparing drugs to berberine and showing pretty impressive effects. Now, there's another point here regarding blood sugar I wanted to make sure to share with you. Looking at a 2023 meta-analysis of 20 randomized control trials, they found a fairly large impact on hemoglobin A1c. So a 2.6 percentage point reduction in hemoglobin A1c when using berberine. And that is a fairly decent jump or improvement. So if we're seeing similar effectiveness for metformin and berberine to lower blood sugar, how is it that we're seeing a better reduction or a really substantial reduction in hemoglobin A1c? Well, bear in mind that as good as and helpful as hemoglobin A1c is, it's an indirect measure of about two to three months of what your blood sugar has looked like. Looking at oxidation of hemoglobin, the higher blood sugar is, the more oxidation there will be. However, inflammation also increases oxidation. So what you'll see in some people is this paradoxically elevated hemoglobin A1c, meaning they have normal blood sugar, yet they have unhealthy and elevated hemoglobin A1c. Part of the reason this can happen is because these people have elevated inflammation. This explains why we see such an improvement in hemoglobin A1c with berberine. Looking at a 2023 meta-analysis, they found that berberine reduced inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and TNF-alpha. So as it pertains to blood sugar, it seems that we almost get this sort of two-for-one benefit again. Improvements in blood sugar, but also improvements in inflammation, which improve this proxy for blood sugar, hemoglobin A1c. So for both inflammation and for blood sugar, I think it's worth considering berberine yet again. Now, the final condition here I wanted to discuss is regarding gut health. There are animal studies showing improvements in leaky gut, in dysbiosis by improving populations of lactobacilli, improving motility, and decreasing gut sensitivity. But we want to see what the outcome data shows us. Now, thankfully, here we have a 2015 randomized control trial with patients who had IBS. So bloating, pain, discomfort, constipation, diarrhea, or both. And they did find improvements in diarrhea, abdominal pain, urgency, and via the gut-brain connection, improvements in anxiety and depression when using berberine. Another data point here I felt worthy of discussion was a 2022 meta-analysis finding that berberine reduced the risk of colorectal adenoma, aka polyps, by 31%. Now, because berberine is an antimicrobial, it might be the antimicrobial 
or sort of antibacterial action that we at least think berberine exerts. Let me just make a, a side comment that in SIBO, berberine is often used to treat SIBO. I'll come back to a study on this in a moment. But at least anecdotally, berberine is recognized to be an antimicrobial, an antibacterial agent. It can fight things like SIBO. So perhaps the reason why we see improvements in colorectal adenoma risk is due to that antimicrobial action. And therefore, maybe antibiotics could also lead to improvements in colorectal adenomas. Well, when I did some fact-checking on this, because I think antibiotics are un or, or, or incorrectly maligned in some cases, and so we want to be evidence-based here and look at, well, maybe something like rifaximin, which can help with SIBO, could also be helpful for colorectal adenomas. And this is not the case. A review paper looking at multiple antibiotics found the aggregate finding that there's actually an increased risk of colorectal adenomas when using antibiotics. This was observational, so it does suffer from limitations. It was just a quick poke into the research literature, but just wanted to share that berberine seems to do something beneficial for colorectal adenomas that's non-dependent upon its sort of skewing of the microbiota, and it's probably due to its anti-inflammatory action. Now, I mentioned a second ago that berberine is sort of a commonplace treatment in natural medicine for SIBO, and to my surprise, when I went to fact check this, there are no trials that have studied directly berberine for SIBO. There is, at current, ongoing, a clinical trial looking at this, but nothing published to date. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the side effects of berberine, it gives me pause in recommending it as a mainstay for gut health. The main side effects reported are constipation, diarrhea, flatulence, and abdominal pain. So there is a one trial in IBS showing benefit. However, we have so many other therapeutics that can be helpful, like probiotics, elemental diets, immunoglobulins, that I would be a little bit wary, or I would at least say not to make berberine a frontline therapeutic in trying to improve your gut health. Now, when using a dose of above 300 milligrams, this is where the side effects seem to pop up, gastrointestinally speaking. The downside is every study that we covered has used a dose well north of 300, usually in the range of 700 milligrams per day up through about 2,500 milligrams per day. Details will follow in the usage comments in a moment. I'm wary that you're going to see the clinical effect that you want to see while staying underneath this 300 milligram dosage limitation that may thwart these gastrointestinal side effects. And so how to use berberine? Using a dose, again, summarizing from all these studies we just covered, anywhere between roughly 700 milligrams per day up through 2,500 100 milligrams per day. A capsule tends to be about 500 milligrams each. And regarding duration, the studies have shown safety and effectiveness for anywhere from six to 12 months. That's what's been studied. That's what's been documented. Might it be fine using it for longer? Perhaps, but we don't have any data to inform that comment yet. And regarding the form of berberine, berberine HCL has been criticized or commented to have poor bioavailability. But this might not be a bad thing if that means it's going to have a somewhat localized effect in the gut. It has not been demonstrated that you need a more bioavailable form. And pretty much every study that we discussed used the, the less bioavailable berberine HCL. So I think you're just fine using a standard berberine HCL due to the fact that all these studies showed or most of these studies showed benefit with this form. So there you have it. Weight loss, probably not. For blood sugar, cholesterol, and inflammation, I think it's a great choice. For gut health, maybe, but be aware of the potential side effects. Okay, there's a recap on berberine. I hope that helps.